even if many people got it, it we didn't really care. And in fact, many people didn't get it. The, um, the, uh, the SARS pandemic uh, actually fizzled out for the opposite reason. The SARS pandemic uh, was 10 times deadlier than the flu. And one of the things about pandemics is that, or such epidemics, is that if the disease is too deadly, it kills its victims before they, it can be transmitted. And that's the reason the SARS pandemic kind of petered out. This disease, this pathogen, has a particular combination of attributes that make it, that have given it this devastating impact. It has intermediate lethality, so it's neither too, neither too deadly nor, nor too benign, and it has intermediate transmissibility. So it's, it's not too hard to transmit, nor is it too easy to transmit. And if you plot all the pandemics that have occurred over the last 100 years, this pandemic, to me, reminds me most of the 1957 pandemic which many of you probably don't remember, but, um, but it, it was a leading killer in our society at the time. Our population was about 150 million, and about 110,000 Americans died, which would be about equivalent to 300,000 Americans dying of this condition. And of course, there's the famous 1918 pandemic, which uh, you know, swept the globe and killed tens of millions of people and played a role in devastating our society. So, so this is a once in every 50 year kind of event that we happen to be in the middle of right now. The reason, what you need to understand about this is that at best, this disease will kill about 35,000 people, at best. And I've been saying that since, since February and trying to get people's attention to this condition along with many other experts who've been trying to get people's attention. Now 35,000 deaths, in case you don't know, is about the number of people that die of motor vehicle accidents every year. and we. We spend a huge billions of dollars in our society dividing our highways, mandating expensive modifications to vehicles. We are sad when people die. We, we read newspaper articles. Some of you provide pastoral care to families whose relatives have died in car accidents, a very sudden death. It's, it's a big impact in our society. What we've basically done right now, if I could wave a magic wand and make motor vehicle accidents stop, we would all be ecstatic. It would be a miracle. Well, now we've basically done the obverse of that. We've added that number of deaths to our society at a minimum. That's the best thing we can expect. And it goes on up from there, unfortunately. And it's difficult because people, for people like me, to talk to lay people because um, there's a range of possible outcomes. And I don't want to be like catastrophizing and like Chicken Little and saying the earth is falling and then if it doesn't fall, people will jeer. And conversely, I don't want to be like an ostrich and put my head in the sand and and then nothing happens, and then people say, why didn't you warn us? So it's hard to, to, to talk about this. And, and this also reflects some broader changes in our society, where over the last 10 to 20 years, we've had what I would describe as a kind of intellectual thinning out of our society. Our science education is worse. We're more politically polarized. People see things in black and white. We're not able to compromise. We're not able to appreciate nuance, you know, subtleties in policymaking. So our intellectual fabric, our capacity, and our, our respect for experts has declined. There's a sense that experts are elites. And so we they have this anti-elitism in our society is affecting our willingness to believe experts. So these things have made it harder in our public discourse to talk about these things. And the reason I mention that is, is, is it is possible that 40% of Americans will ultimately, over the next two or three years, be infected by this condition. That's what happened in 1957. Not everyone will be infected, I need to be clear. But, you know, let's say as many as half could be infected. Let's say 40% over the next two to three years. And if the infection fatality ratio, the fraction of people who get infected die, is on the low end of what doctors predict, the very lowest I've seen is 0.3% which would make this condition three times as deadly as the flu. It's probably five to 10 times as deadly, but let's say it's only three times as deadly. Three out of 1,000 people who get infected die, let's say, on average. It's worse for the elderly, it's better for the young. Well, if 40% of Americans get infected, that's 120, a little bit more, Amer million Americans. And if 0.3% and if, uh, of them die, that's 360,000 Americans dying. That's a big killer. I mean, that's like a top, you know, that's like up there almost with cancer and heart disease. So this is a serious thing our nation is confronting right now. 
And in a bit, we can talk about some of the other difficulties in deciding what to do. Like, do we tank our economy and go into a depression, which also will kill people. Poverty kills people. People lose hope and they kill themselves from suicide. You know, there's lots of ways in which economic stagnation also is deadly. So, the, the, so that's some aspects of it. A further aspect is that what's happening right now is that we know from genetic studies that there's no natural immunity to this epidemic, to this pathogen. We've never seen it before so far. Maybe there are some people who have some mutations who, for whatever reason, are relatively immune. We, we don't know this yet. We will eventually know this. Scientists will know this. But because we're immunologically naive, this pathogen is sweeping through the population like a wave. So we are about to be hit by a wave. And, and this is what all this discussion about flattening the curve is about. Because if 100,000 Americans are going to die in the next year from this condition, it makes all the difference in the world if they all die next month it, or versus if they all die 10,000 at a time over 10 months. Because if they all die next month, they're going to collapse our healthcare system, just like happened in Italy and in Wuhan, where the epidemic first began, because it'll overwhelm. No, no nation has the ICU bed capacity to cope with this number of sick, seriously ill people at once. Um, and also, the, why do healthcare workers die so much of this condition? Part of the reason healthcare workers are at special risk is that they are, when they get an inoculum, when they get a, a dose of the pathogen, you and I might get a small dose. We touch something or we kiss someone and we get a little dose. But when you're intimately working on patients and you're intubating them or doing something, you get a lot of virus at once and it overwhelms your body. And that's why so many healthcare workers in China and in Italy have been afflicted and died even of this condition, even though they're relatively young. And then of course, when they die, we lose them just when we need them to fight the epidemic. So that's why we're trying to flatten the curve. We, we, we don't have any drugs or vaccines, nor will we for a while, uh, that will um, be effective in uh, addressing this. So we only have uh, tools that involve social distancing, where we're trying to slow down. It's like we're building breakwaters. A tsunami is coming, and we want to convert it into a slow-moving tide. So the same water comes ashore, but now it comes slowly instead of all at once. And that's why we're doing the social distancing. That's why your churches are being canceled, which is the right thing to do. Uh, that's why we are being encouraged to stay at home. And that's why in that essay I wrote in the Washington Post, I, I try to point out that you would think that the brave and altruistic thing to do is to go out and about, to show you're not afraid of the virus, to, to engage in the kind of pastoral work that you do. And I'll come back to the pastoral work because you will all be called upon to take risks and be brave. And it's not going to be easy, just like doctors and nurses. But it is not, in fact, the compassionate thing to do to go out and about. It is not the compassionate thing to keep the churches open. That's the wrong thing to do for our society. That is fostering spread of the virus. And so if we really want to help our neighbor, we have to stay home. That's what we have to do to help our neighbor. And the reason it's not a selfish thing to do when we're staying home, it's not because we're afraid or we are staying home. When we stay home, we interrupt the path through us that the virus could take to reach other bodies. So you, you talk to Bob, the virus comes to you, and then you give it to Tom, Dick, and Harry. And that's, we don't want that. We want you to stay home so you interrupt that spread of the virus through us to blunt, to, to flatten the curve so fewer cases appear so that our healthcare system can work. If we flatten the curve, we, have, we achieve at least several things. First of all, we don't collapse our healthcare system. Second, we allow the healthcare system to work so we save more lives, so we don't run out of ventilators, so we don't, the doctors aren't exhausted and the nurses, so that we can actually do a better job of caring for the people who are sick, which means fewer deaths. And third, we push some of the curve into the future, into far into the future, when either we might have a vaccine or we'll know better how to care for those people, so we'll also reduce and prevent those deaths. And that's why we're talking about flattening the curve and all of the various measures that have been done. People have banned public gatherings and school closures has been done multiple times for over a century. It's been studied. It's, it's effective. It works to do what we're doing. The problem is we are tanking our economy and, um, and people are losing their jobs. And, uh, and this is going to create a lot of burdens for everybody, including churches. And we can talk about that. 
So that's just an introduction to the epidemiology of the condition. It's possible for people, I'll make a couple of footnotes, it's possible for people to be asymptomatic and transmit the disease. When you get the disease, only about half of the people even have symptoms. Most people get it, they don't even know they have it or they have mild symptoms and then they're immune, which is great. Uh, of the remainder, they have varying levels of uh, seriousness. About 5% will need ICU care, and that's a problem because if hundreds of thousands of people need, get the condition and 5% need ICU care, we don't have that many ICU beds in our nation. Or ICU nurses, which is an even, even uh, scarcer, actually, commodity. But the people who get it, typically after you get it, it takes 2 to 14 days before you get symptoms. And then... Um, but it looks like for some large, some non-trivial fraction of people for two to three days before they're symptomatic, they become infectious. That means you can spread the disease even when you don't have symptoms yourself for some number of people. And that's a problem. Something like HIV is like that. You can spread HIV before you know you have symptoms, but something like smallpox is not like that. You, you have to have smallpox, you get symptoms before you can spread it. So, that's a much easier disease to tackle. If the person has symptoms, you know they're sick, you can quarantine them. But if you don't know they're sick, you can't quarantine them. There's been a collapse in our society in, in testing. This was a big mistake, and I'm upset with the leadership in our nation that has for months been downplaying the severity of this threat and, and uh, reassuring the public when we should have been preparing the public for the difficult road ahead. And, um, and we did not do what Korea or Taiwan did. We did not have adequate testing. The disease had landed, we're pretty sure, on the west and east coast of this country by the middle of January. And so it was already spreading. But the testing that people have been talking about is testing for the RNA of the virus. That's testing and detecting the presence of the virus in your body. We, we kind of dropped the ball on that, although we could try to catch up and do some more testing. We should be doing more testing, but really what we need is a different kind of test called serological testing. So the current test that everyone's talking about is when you put a swab in someone's throat, take a specimen and look for the virus. But what we really wanna know now is a different kind of test where we take some of your blood and see whether you have antibodies to the virus and are immune. Because in fact, there are probably many people who are staying at home right now who had the virus, who, were, um, who never had any symptoms and are now immune, or who had a bad cold or a mild cold a month ago, and actually that was COVID, and they're immune, and there's no way to know it. The test for the virus, the virus is gone from their body. So we need to test for the antibodies in their bodies to see. And those people are really valuable because they can go out and about, and they can work, and they can be healthcare workers. Some of you pastors and priests will, will be immune, and it will make all the difference in the world to your job if you know you're immune to go into a family's home and take care of them versus you don't know if you're immune. In which case, it's not just a question of bravery if you're willing to run the risk of getting sick by going into their home, you could actually uh, more easily spread the disease to other people. Incidentally, you can do that anyway, even if you are immune, because you could touch them and take the germ, but that's a wrinkle. So, so that's an introduction a little bit to the biology and epidemiology and history of pandemic disease. I probably skipped a few things you wanted to hear about. I'm trying to rack my brains if there's anything I wanted to tell you about. Let me tell you then, let me address your questions. And uh, oh, so the governor may well shut down the churches anyway, but if you're inclined to keep any churches or, or services open, you've got to practice physical distancing. So people need to sit six feet apart every, all, every other pew or something like that. We can talk about soup kitchens. I'm very worried about the homeless. We can talk about uh, shops, you know, where you sell uh, uh, goods. Um, we can talk about um, hospice programs. I was a hospice doctor for, for 15 years. I took care of people who were dying, and I, I know some of you provide that kind of stuff. We can talk about your pastoral roles and, and that uh, if you want, but let me just work through the questions here. It says, can, do, do people have to stay in their own yard? And um, uh, can you give any thoughts and words to use with people who think that children should be in school or that worship should go on no matter what? No, children should not be in school and worship should not go on. That's irresponsible. It is not compassionate. It is harmful to our society. You are providing 
you're surrendering your body to be a vehicle for the transmission of infection to your neighbors when you do that. You can be in your yard all you want. You can make calculated risks about having your kids play with other people's kids. You know, in my own family, unfortunately, we've decided I have three grown children who are in their 20s, and then I have one 10-year-old son that we adopted, who I adore. And uh, so, you know, he's in a play date range. And unfortunately, we've decided that he cannot have play dates. Part of the reason is that even though he's unlikely, very unlikely to get sick, thank God that children don't suffer from this condition, but he could transmit it to us. And he could, you know, and Eric and I are in our late 50s and we don't particularly want to get it. You could, if, you're a, if your neighbor is a healthcare worker and you want to share childcare because that person's a nurse or a doctor, you could arrange like, it's a, it's a slightly increased risk, but it's a, not an unreasonable thing to do to like to have a small group of kids, like two families that are playing together and you're basically one infection unit. And you understand that if it enters that unit, everyone will get infected, but at least that's a much smaller group than moving in large groups. I'm interested in best recommendations to take back for ongoing safety and care of our community. I think you need to reinforce the hand washing message. I think you need to prepare Americans for a long, battle. We don't know yet. We'll know more in two weeks, but I am very worried. I'm very worried that people don't realize that um, this reminds me of stories that my grandfather used to tell me about the German occupation, the Nazi occupation of Athens. This is a kind of event or like, or like the Vietnam War or you know, this is or, or a little like 9-11. I mean, this is an unusual event. I mean, people don't have a lot of experience with this. We could see, it's possible, and I'm not saying this to be alarmist, we could see military MASH style field hospitals set up in front of our hospitals on the driveway where people come seeking medical care and the ICUs are already filling up in New York and San Francisco and they will fill up across the nation. No part is gonna be spared. Where people are turned away because they don't know ventilators or no beds to die. This happened in Italy. This happened in Wuhan. There's no reason to think it won't happen here. And there hasn't been any such reason for months. This, this, the fact that we have not mobilized for the last two months is, is shocking and offends my conscience. So any expert in the CDC or the NIH could have told anybody that this is what was gonna happen. There was no escaping this. There's, this is a pandemic disease. It goes everywhere. Closing the borders doesn't stop it. Um, and I can tell you if you want the data on border closings and if they work. So, um, so, so people need to take this very seriously and it's a public duty to, to socially distance, physically distance. And I wanna change the jargon from social distancing to physical distancing. Even though we're physically distant, we have to bond together as a community to fight this. How long will we know that we can resume our weekly worship gatherings? Um, what the, the end game, <coughs> the end game for this is that the pathogen is going to become endemic to human beings. It's going to be like the flu, another pathogen that is in our species and that circulates. And so eventually anyone that's going to get the disease is going to get it. Eventually, maybe 40% approximately of the planet will get this condition. Many will die. What we're trying to do is reduce the force of mortality immediately. Usually the pathogen will mutate and get milder. The pathogen doesn't want to kill us, quote unquote. It, it, if it's milder, it can get more victims. And there's gonna be a second wave of this. So usually with respiratory diseases in the summer, those decline uh, with the heat and with the people moving out of doors. But unfortunately, there's no evidence that this condition will do that. I think we're going to get mild, if any, relief during the summer. And then when people go back to school and to work at the end of August, it's going to come back with a vengeance. And, um, and, uh, and we'll have a second wave, which is typical of, of pandemics. It happened with 1918. It happened in 1957. It happened in 2009 with the H1N1. That's what happens. And then it, it keeps spreading. So eventually, everyone who's going to get it is going to get it. And then we'll get herd immunity. When enough of us are immune, 
then the pathogen won't be able to move as easily through the system and people will get sick, but at a low rate and we can, our healthcare system can care for them. So when you ask me when you can resume weekly worship gatherings, that's a very difficult question to answer because I can tell you the public health answer and that's gonna be, we're gonna to wanna to see when we have evidence that the epidemic is flattening and or when we have a vaccine and we won't have a vaccine for at least another 18 months or 12 at least, maybe 24 months. So typically, but people will tire of the restrictions on their mobility and they'll, and so if you resume worship services, let's say over the summer, you're gonna still need to do physical distancing. How long will this last? It's gonna last a couple of years. And what our nation is gonna to have to do is gonna to have to find a way to have its economy stood up for what's gonna be a very difficult period for us, but it will end. This is not like, this is an external threat that has a known end date. How can I let people know I'm not afraid, but trying to keep them safe? I'm live streaming and Zooming my classes. I think you, we have to reinforce this. You could certainly send them my, my Washington Post and you could say, look, you know, I'm, I, I, we are all gonna have to not be afraid. But the irony is, is that what we need to do is keep physical distance. And, and that's, I mean, you just have to reinforce that message. You're, you're, you're helping others by not allowing your body to be a vehicle for transmission of this pathogen. China is finally having days without COVID. Okay, the reason China is doing that, and I'll shut up in a minute, I've already gone half an hour. The reason China is doing that is China, beginning January the 25th, passed regulations that put 930 million people under house arrest, basically, home confinement. Since then, a billion people have been in home confinement <coughs> for almost two months. <clears throat> And why Americans weren't paying attention, I have no idea. Why did we think, oh, a billion, China just put a billion people, like it wasn't going to affect us? I mean, you know, this was, they used basically a social nuclear weapon to confront this opponent, this virus. And that's what we're facing. We're facing the same virus. And that's why China. But China has not, what China has done is it stopped the spread of the disease. It's not eradicated the virus. So the virus is gonna come back to China, just like it's coming back to Hong Kong. What they have done is they've bought themselves time. They've built hospitals, they've learned about the virus, they've prepared their citizenry for the kind of long haul that's gonna be needed. Of course, they're very authoritarian culture and a very collectivist culture. And so they're more willing in, you know, to, take, to, to do what dutifully what they're told. When I saw these people at spring break in Florida, you know, I just, well, that's Americans. And, and we Americans have many strengths. We're a rich nation. We have the best scientists in the world. We have an open society, but we have been squandering those resources in my view. Um, how is it possible to estimate the duration of this epidemic in particular region? We're not gonna be better. We're gonna be a little laggard. We had, and I'll shut up, I'm almost done. We had, I was, I live in Norwich, Vermont. I was like, okay, it's gonna come here, but we're gonna get it six months after all the big cities. And what happened? We had a person who came from Italy to Hanover, New Hampshire, and he didn't obey the rule to self-isolate and other people got infected. And there's a little red dot, like on my little safe little corner of the world, right from the beginning in this country. So there's no way to, to, to keep ourselves any different. We are lucky we're rural. People are more spread out. Um, and that helps, but it's gonna, it's gonna affect us just like it affects everyone else. Anyway, that's my 30 minute introduction. I, don't, I saw that you recorded this. If you actually would be, if you make a transcript, I'd be grateful for the transcript of my remarks. And if you don't, I'd be very grateful if you shared uh, my remarks back with me, Jason, if you can. Great, thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Christakis. I know it's, it's uh... It's a challenge to give applause uh, through Zoom, but I'm, I'm sure we can all uh, we can click the, uh, the applause icon in cyber and send you some gratitude for, for that uh, half hour uh, explanation of where things are and a quick walkthrough of a bunch of the questions that uh, people here had brought. Um, so I think for where we are now, I, I would love to see what questions people do have that haven't been addressed so far. Oh, uh, Dina has already gotten herself uh, 
her hand raised uh, in Zoom. She's apparently well practiced at it. So uh, um, can you unmute yourself, Dina, and you want to bring a question? Yeah, I only know how to use Zoom because of the program by Alice and Tom. But um, unless I blinked, I, I missed it. Um, did, you, did you give advice on uh, community meals or soup kitchens? So I'm part yes. of an organization that does community meals and I'm concerned about that. Yes, and I think, let me say a couple things about that. First of all, this is a situation in which the usual arguments about helping the vulnerable among us, the poor, the chronically ill, the homeless, actually there is a pro bono publico motivation because we do not want those populations to be reservoirs of illness. It helps, it helps you when you help the poor or you help the homeless because we are reducing the spread of the virus. We do not want rampant infection in homeless people. So things like AA meetings can take place if people keep six feet distance, if they come into the church, so they're not jumbling against each other as they come through the door. And if, they, if you arrange the chair so they're far apart, the whole name of the game is physical distancing. And then you can meet some of the needs of the AA community and that. Same with homeless. What I would recommend you do is, is you put boxed meals and you distribute boxed meals where people line up at a table and you hand out one meal. So it's not as communal where people sit down, but you deliver boxed meals. If you, if you insist and you feel it's necessary for them to sit, you have to do what the Chinese do, which is maybe put up little cardboard dividers between people like, like a voting booth or keep them one person per table, little tiny tables. Then the table has to be washed after each person eats their meal and they have to be encouraged to eat quickly and leave so that you can meet the same number of people. You're gonna to have to staff up probably because you're spacing people out. You may need twice the staff to deliver the same stuff. If you do it in a physical environment, you may be able to deliver box meals with the same staff by packaging and handing out the materials. Okay. Same with church stores. If you wanna keep the church stores open, you problem is you can have to let fewer people in at a time, but then you have to, what the Chinese do is they test people's temperature so that if you're febrile, you can't come into the store and, the, and it, it's low grade fever over a hundred. But then the problem is you have to sterilize the thermometer or use one of those like flash things. And uh, you run some risk that the person will be asymptomatic and spread the germ onto, uh, the germ lives for about three days on steel and plastic. It lives much less long on copper and paper. Uh, so then if they handle goods in your store, your store is, you know, becoming, you have to, you have to clean everything. I mean, standards of cleanliness have to go up. Hmm. I saw that, um, uh, John Dina, Hopkins. Did I, did, Dina, did I answer your question? Sorry. Well, I don't want to take up a lot of people's time, but I'm, I, I think a, lo a lot of the community meals organizations have gone to, to go packages, but I'm worried about like the standard of cleaning and you know transmission on the boxes and no if your workers if your workers wear gloves and are afebrile then uh, I think they can prepare the meals and distribute them if you're worried that you'll have a worker that'll infect a lot of your clients then you you know they need to stay stay home if they're symptomatic uh, take they could take their own temperatures if you trust them and don't come to work if you're febrile and then they wear gloves and prepare the food in a hygienic manner Thank you. Thanks. All right, John Hopkins, I, I, did I see your hand go up earlier? Yeah. So um, I have to say that overall, like people in my faith community have been very supportive of not having church exactly for the reasons that you name. Uh, the few people that think we're overreacting, um, one of the things that keeps coming up is this, uh, one of the cruise ships, and that they're not, re and I guess 700 people got it, but nobody died. So That's I'm just true. wondering if you've read the, and, and somebody sent me a, um, uh, an article by an epidemiologist about how we're overreacting and, and they use yes. that as a specific example. I'm wondering if you know anything about that, if you could just talk about that. Yeah, I've seen both of the articles that are circulating by very smart people that are say we're overreacting. And one is by a man by the name of John Ioannidis at uh, Stanford. <coughs> I tweeted out a response to that. I think what John <coughs> misunderstood is that this epidemic is a wave. 
he, he, didn't, he didn't pay attention to the temporal element. That is to say that all of, you know, all of these people are gonna die at once. And I think people are gonna start, when, when, when people start dying because they can't get medical care in about two weeks or four weeks at the most, this whole conversation we're having will seem silly. And all of the people you're talking to will say, oh my God, I can't believe it. You know, Susie went to the hospital and they told her there was nothing for her and that she had to go home to die. I mean, this happened in Italy. This happened in Wuhan. What the hell makes us think we're different? We're Americans. I mean, this is the kind of, you know, so I would tell your parishioners, I told the Anidis in my response is like, well, what happened in Italy? You know, what, what was that an overreaction? I mean, what makes you think? The other one that's circulating is a New York Times piece from a, a couple of weeks ago or a week ago. And there the argument is more subtle. It has to do with the health costs of the recession that we're inducing, the economic collapse. And this is a hard decision for anybody, including policymakers. But, and you could get in front of the American public and you could say, more people will die if we collapse our economy than will die from this disease. Therefore, I'm preparing you for the fact that we're gonna have awful scenes, like photographs of soldiers with their intestines blown out on the battlefield, not sanitized over sending our, our, work, our soldiers abroad to fight and you don't even know what's happening. You're gonna see awful scenes and you need to have the stomach for that if that's your argument. It's not a crazy argument. It's not devoid of reason, but it's, it's a fantasy if you think that we can keep our economy up and cope with the number of cases we're likely to have. We might get lucky, we might, but you have to ask yourself, why, are, why is New York different than Italy? Italy's a rich democracy and it has you know, a fifth of the population than we do and it's been brought low by this condition. There's, there's nothing different about us. Really, there isn't. We live, there's some of the small differences. We don't have intergenerational households as much. In Italy, one of the problems was that young people would go out and about and come home and they live with grandpa. And so they would give it to grandpa, whereas we don't do that as much. You know, we have fewer intergenerational households, but there's not a lot of difference between us and the Italians. Now, furthermore- Do you the, know the, the name of the person who wrote the New York Times op-ed think, that you're talking about? I think it was Katz was his name. He's a colleague, Katz, K-A-T-Z. He's a colleague of mine at Yale. He wrote it a few days ago. And the other one was by Ioannidis. It was in a, in a technical, you know, scientific publication called Stat News. But see, here's the other thing. The Diamond Princess thing you heard is wrong. It's a lie. There were 700 people infected. Seven died uh, of the people that infected. That's 1% death rate. I mean, you know, and that's how many died initially. More could still be dying that, you know, we haven't updated our statistics. So it's, uh, it's a falsehood that, uh, that, that the Diamond Princess, that nobody died. We know people die of this condition. It's, it's not the flu. And even if it were the flu, it would be like if everyone who's going to get the flu got it tomorrow. Our healthcare system couldn't cope with that. Eventually, it will be like the flu. Three years from now, this will be another you know, respiratory disease that circulates if we're lucky. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thanks for that answer. <laughs> Uh, not everyone has their video on, uh, so I can't see hand raises, but I, if there's more, uh, more questions that people have on their minds that you want to take advantage of? Oh, TJ, is that, are you unmuting? Uh, there we go. Hi. Hi. Um, what is the possibility of this, uh, virus mutating again in fairly short order is, or is it going to be a while so uh there's been an international consortium of scientists that have been sequencing the the um the rna in this virus and uploading their sequences around the world and this has allowed scientists to track in real time it's called um i'm blocking on the name of the website you can go to the website it's um blocking on it right now. But anyway, you can, you, we literally are tracking the mutation of the virus in real time. We have no evidence that there, there are meaningful differences in strains of the virus at this point, you know, more or less toxic strains. Probably the virus will become more benign as time goes by. There's a remote chance it'll mutate and become more deadly. We don't know yet, but there's not been a lot, you know, there have, it's, it's an animal. I mean, it's a, it's a living thing. It's so, actually there's a debate about whether viruses are living. That's another whole thing, but you know, it's a biological thing. And so it, it mutates and uh, you know, it, um, it's doing its thing, but so far it hasn't mutated to get much, much 
milder or much more severe. Did I answer your question? Yes, yes, I think so, thank you. Hello, my name is Pat Hinking. I have two questions, both related to the lack of testing. <coughs> the first is, how does that impact our actual knowledge about what's happening with the spread of disease? And the second is whether insurance companies are or will deny coverage for treatment if the diagnosis has not been verified by testing. I don't know the answer to the second question. I'm worried. I think the government should and likely will pass legislation that makes testing widely available and even free as it should be because it's in the public health. It's in our interest. It's in my interest for you all to be tested. Right. If, if you're immune on the second kind of test, if the, on the first kind of test is an RNA test, are you sick? And if you have a test and then you can be isolated, either because you're willing to be isolated or because you're forced to be isolated, that's great. That protects me and everyone else. And the second kind of test, the serologic test that tests if you're immune, I want that to be free too, because if you're immune, you can go back to work. You can deliver food to me. You can work in factories. You can restore our economy. That's terrific. Plus, uh, I, I uh, can have confidence that if you deliver stuff to me, et cetera, you're okay. So, so I think that testing is likely to be low cost or free. I don't know, I'm not an expert on insurance regulations and laws related to that. I suspect that'll all be worked out. There's gonna be a huge commercial market for these tests. Some are already, the serologic tests are already available. There's gonna be a big debate about how accurate they are. All of that's gonna happen, but that'll happen pretty fast. But I think it should be, and I've been, saying this on Twitter and, and in all my meetings with various important people, you know, in our country, that this, this should be a national priority to roll out the serologic test and that they should be free. Uh, you know, we haven't had, there've been lots and lots of people that have been going to Dartmouth-Hitchcock who should be tested, including two members of my household who had upper respiratory infections and I thought should be tested, but they didn't fit the protocol and I don't think there were enough tests. It, it's just, it's, it's an absurd, Honestly, it's inexcusable that we, st as a nation, we just watched what was happening in China and took false reassurance that we didn't need to worry. I don't know why, uh, I mean, and then didn't prepare. You know, we, we don't, our nation, the richest nation that has ever existed, we don't have, the reason we can't test right now is we don't have the swabs. They're like a big Q-tip that you put in someone's throat to get the specimen. That's like what's holding us back from doing tests. I mean, it's ridiculous. Honestly, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm very extra, I'm, I haven't slept in, in two months, honestly, and I, you know, I've been seeing this thing coming, you know, and I've been trying to get attention, and it's just, you know, we're here now. Anyway, I'm sorry, go on. Did I answer your question, Pat? Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. I see, I see Paul's hand up. Paul? Good afternoon, doctor. Do we have any information on the transmissibility post-mortem? Postpartum, you mean from mother to child? No, postmortem. Postmortem, like with dead bodies? Yeah. Uh, I haven't seen any. Uh, I would say certainly by three days, I can't imagine the virus would be transmissible. So if it's like, I don't know much about the f undertaking business or funeral business, and I don't know much about funerals, and I don't know how rapidly they take place in different denominations, so I'm not an expert on all that. But, you know, I, I would suspect that immediately upon death, the body can still transmit this, but certainly within a day or two or three, it probably cannot. I haven't seen any material on this. Do you have a more specific question that I might be able to answer more definitively? Uh, perhaps not within your wheelhouse, but just thinking about some of what we're seeing in Italy with the impact on funeral services and the distancing that's necessary there for them right now. And so trying to think a little ahead for that. My understanding of the reason they had mass graves in Iran, for example, where the, the Islamic tradition involves bathing the body, you know, it, it very immediately and in a very intimate way, uh, they, uh, is that it was the volume. There was so many deaths they couldn't keep up. Just think about that. I, I don't think any one of your parishioners understands that that could happen in New Hampshire. I mean, there'd be so many people dying that we cannot keep up. It's, you know, and I'm not saying that's going to happen. I want you to understand. I'm not saying, don't leave this call and say, oh my God, Professor Krasakis thinks we're all going to die. I don't want to be alarmist. I don't want to be um, dramatic. But I'm just saying it's, that is a possibility with what we're talking about right now. It is possible. It's not, it happened in Italy. It happened in Iran. It happened in Wuhan. 
it could happen here. There's no obvious reason it couldn't. So my understanding of the of those things and in, in the films was they just keep up. Now I don't know enough about the Catholic tradition to know what's done with the body and how quickly it needs to be coped with. But but I think you if you wait a while, I don't see any reason you couldn't uh, physically deal with the body. And and I, and I, and I if it was really important, I could spend some time and try to find out what's known from the Chinese data. Thank you. Other questions that people have on their minds? Uh, uh, Claudia's hand has gone up. I see Claudia and then Aaron. I'm sorry because I, I joined late. So you may have already answered this question, but I know one question that we have in our household is how long are you anticipating, if you have any idea, how long um, this is going to go on? Well, I, I did answer that, but let me quickly summarize what I said. I, 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 this is uh, in the nature of serious pandemics. This is going to be with us for a couple of years till things sort of settle down. The end game is that it'll become an endemic disease like the flu, the regular flu, although this is a different pathogen. And, and how long we have to engage in physical distancing will depend on a lot of difficult decisions about how, what economic price we're willing to pay the willingness of Americans to tolerate death um, uh, and those types of complicated decisions. So I, it's, it's not the kind of thing that's gonna end. I mean, you, we could suddenly stop physical distancing and say, okay, five, half a million people are gonna die in the next you know, three months and all the media will have horror stories of young people and people turned away from hospitals and everything else, but you know, nobody has prepared the Americans for that. And, uh, but we could do that. That, well, that would be a strategy um, to take that risk and do that. But I, what I suspect would happen in that situation is we would still tank our economy because massive death is bad for the economy. And we would have panic and and then it would be too late to do physical distancing because so we get none of the bet we get we we just you know it's it's a lose lose all around uh, if we if we whereas now we at least get a little time to figure out how we're going to deal with it. We as a country we have about two point eight beds per I can't remember if it's per thousand or per ten thousand people we have about a third as many hospital beds or fourth as Japan we have. Um, uh, about half as many as Australia, as I remember. We have about the same number as the Brits. We have five times as many as India and many more orders than that in Africa. Another whole thing that no one's talking about is how it's going to uh, affect the Southern Hemisphere. And there's gonna be a lot of death up from this, unfortunately, in other parts of the world. Thank you. I, I see uh, Aaron was next with a question and then Dina. Uh, thank you, doctor, for uh, being here. Thank you, Jason, for putting this on. Uh, my, my question is, is for the practical nature, um, for, our for our worshiping community in my church, uh, we've developed, found another way to kind of <laughs> meet and gather. For the groups that we host, um, uh, addiction groups and 12-step groups, We've shut our facility down for a week. Uh, you mentioned, uh, uh, you know, the possibility of, of creating that physical space for each one uh, within within those um, within those groups. Uh, what what's the I, I, what's the balance point for uh, extending an invitation for those groups or encouraging people to keep at home? Um, is, well, I mean, a simple question. I, I think 12 step programs are incredibly important. And you know, you got to weigh the risks that people are going to relapse and die from that versus get right. COVID. And uh, I, 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 a, a reasonable compromise strategy, in my view, unless is uh, uh, if they're younger than 60. So if you're a 70 year old alcoholic or drug user, I, I think you should be staying home, period. Okay. But if you're younger than 60, and if you can have the church basement cleaned out, you know, nicely cleaned before they come in. And you set up the chairs like with little markers on the floor so that they're, you know, six feet apart and you don't let them all jumble against each other as they come through the door. Then I think you can have your meeting and then you clean the surfaces afterwards. Then you can do it. I think that's okay. 
you know, because you have to weigh the benefits and the costs. There's some risk you'll get some transmission, but on the other hand, not doing it also is bad. But you can't have an A meeting the usual way where people are shoulder to shoulder and milling around outside sharing cigarettes. I mean, you know, that's, you know, no, you can't do that. Your church will become a, a hot spot. You know, you'll, you'll be in the news in, in a month where outbreaks centered at your church, why it's traced to your AA meeting. Um, because people didn't obey the rules. This is the other thing, the, you know, this is a bit of a cultural thing. Like, you know, when Taiwan tells its citizens, okay, everyone stay home right now, they'll do it, you know? But we don't, if we did, we could get more freedom, ironically, in this particular moment. You know, if, we, if, if, if everyone could be trusted to, to keep the physical distancing, then we could actually have more people out and about. But it's partly because we don't, can't have confidence in that. I mean, I, I read uh, the governor of California banned public gatherings and thousands of Americans went to the beach. I saw a photograph yesterday, you know, and those young people might not get, there's little evidence. I mean, some young people die, but it's a low prevalence of young people, but there are more young people. So we may see, a, we're gonna see a lot of stories of young people dying, but it's just because they're so numerous and they're out and about, but it's still much more fatal. So, so our best estimates are that 0.2% of people younger than 30 die if they get it. About 1% to 2% of people our age die if they get it. So, you know, in late 50s, let's say. And if you're older than 80, it's about 20% fatal. And that's, that's if you have, you know, just, just it, you know, that's if you have good medical care. Thank you. Uh, I know I'm mindful for the time winding down, but I do see we had one last question from from Dina, and then I then I would like to ask you a question if we have a spare. Yes, minute. let's do two more. Unfortunately, yes. I ha I have so many demands on my time right now. I yes. uh, we're doing a lot of research in my lab on this, and anyway, um, I might ask you for a favor. Actually, we are we're going to launch an app that uh, I think will be helpful in forecasting risk, and I may come back to you, Jason, with a request to advertise its availability through your community. absolutely yeah I'd, I'd be happy and, to do that and do let me know if you can give me a transcript of my remarks if, if that or at least the audio of it so yes recorded it I'm sorry two more questions and then let's let me go so, oh, so my my question was you had mentioned doctor that um, some people become immune but yes. I had read that there were recurrences of um, COVID-19 yes. in China. Could you explain that? Yes, it's, it's probably very unlikely that there are recurrences. It's conceivable, but probably the recurrences to date, probably, and it's, I don't know yet, it's still not known, are false negative tests. In other words, you have the disease, you're positive, you're positive, you're positive, then we take a test, and oh, it says you're negative. And then we take another test a week later and says, oh, you're positive again. That's not a second infection. It's just that there was a false negative test in the string. So that's what people think. I suspect the reinfection is, is uncommon. I, I'm not prepared to say it never happens, but I don't think that's going to be a... We have many other more serious problems. Great. Thank you. Um, one question that has been on my mind that has really <laughs> come up just in the past few days, uh, Doctor, is that... Um, clergy are becoming aware that uh, they're going to be asked to do something they do a lot, uh, which is to visit people in the hospital. Yes. And, uh, that may be related to corona or that may not be just a regular hospital visit to do prayer, uh, pastoral yes. counseling, uh, end of life consultation. Yes. Um, and people are not sure what to make of that. They know those requests are coming, but yes. want to be prepared with something. Yes constructive what, what's your advice yes you're gonna have to be brave I mean that's yeah. part of the pastoral role that's different than holding church services and infecting your your congregants and and you're gonna have to take some risk ideally you would have personal protective equipment you know that you would walk into a hospital and you'd be given a mask now they might not have masks for us now you know and uh and you wash your hands before you go in and you sit at the bedside. If you don't touch too many things and you wash your hands as you leave the room, then, you know, I think that's a tolerable risk given, given what it is. I, I worked, I was a hospice doctor. I mean, I've seen right. ministers come to the bedside countless times. Uh, 
I remember one occasion I was so distressed by what was happening and the priest was, at, I was I'm not even Catholic. The priest was administering last rites. I said, Father, could you bless me too? You know, I mean, you know, it is, it is so stressful. I understand. But I think we, you need to make sure you're not a vehicle for transmission to others. But you need to practice good hygiene and you need to, um, you need to, uh, to uh, take, tolerate some, some risk, unfortunately. And this is why I'm so upset about the lack of personal protective equipment. I was a doctor during the HIV. I'm not clinically active anymore. I stopped seeing patients 10 years ago. I, do, I run a research lab. But I was a doctor during the HIV epidemic in the 90s, and we took risks. You know, the blood would get on us when we drew blood from HIV-positive patients and it would splatter in our, in our eyes or in our nose sometimes, and we'd be worried we got the infection. It wasn't so transmissible, but we were but it was part of the job. It's a calling, you know, I get it. Mm -hmm. But we had equipment, you know, it's like sending a, a, a police officer out without a gun or a, or, a, or, a, or a bulletproof vest or a fireman, you know, naked into a burning building. I mean, we give them equipment, you know, and now our doctors are expected to take these risks without equipment. It's, 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 it's ridiculous, honestly. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm animated again because I, I'm, I'm upset, you know, that we have not prepared in the last two months and now we have this absurd situation where dartmouth hitchcock puts out a call for any no amount too small of personal protective equipment that people have at home it's embarrassing that our hospitals have to do that and so you guys too are going to be in that situation and i think if you go into a room and you're six feet up you wash your hands you stay six feet away mm -hmm. it's not it's going to not be in your nature i get it I think that's better than nothing, and you should do that. You're going to run a little risk. If you want to touch someone's hand, and then you wash your hands afterwards without touching your face, it's a small risk, but you may choose to do that. You know, I don't think you should avoid pastoral duties. I've been reading horrible stories about people who were dying of COVID, and the hospitals would prevent the relatives from going to the bedside. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's awful. I mean, as a hospice doctor, I can't imagine allowing people to die alone. You know, I mean, it just offends my conscience so anyway i don't have a good answer for you on that i think that is a fantastic answer I, th I i think that is really helpful in making those judgment calls about where risks are um and uh, how that fits into congregational life pastoral counseling soup kitchens and all of that yeah uh, that's, that's a really helpful way to help make some judgments Okay. Thank you. And you should also ask for forbearance from your practitioners. Like one of the things that I've been telling is you should ask them, do not go to the healthcare system unless you have a serious problem. Because those doctors are working hard right now. Mm -hmm. and, um, and, and also, you don't want to be in an emergency room with a minor condition because you could get COVID yourself. So you could, the double way. I mean, it's good for you. It's good for the, good for the doctors, which is good for the society. And, uh, and you might even say the same thing to your parishioners right now. If you, you might say, you know, the time may come soon where I have to prioritize my pastoral duties and I'm asking for your forbearance mm -hmm. because, you know, there's one of me and they're, you know, they're, we're doing what best we can and we need to band together and, you know, et cetera. So anyway, good luck. Please don't hesitate to email me. I, I can't promise to answer right away, but I'll do my best. Thank you so much. I, I'm mindful it's five o'clock, so we're grateful for your time. Uh, this is absolutely marvelous. Thank so you. thank you for this hour. You're welcome. Thank you. Good luck with your own important work. Yeah. We'll, we'll be in touch. Thank you. And if there's um, other folks, I know Dr. Christakis earlier said that he was um, just on the phone with the Prime Minister of Greece. So uh, he, he has some high profile people who are wanting his insights just like he gave us here. Um, so he's going to go do that. Um, I am happy to stay on the line with you all because the Prime Minister of Greece is not calling me. Um, uh, I'm happy to stick around if we want to talk some more. Um, I certainly can't do what he does uh, and neither can you, but we could probably put our heads together, ask some questions, um, and see who else is facing similar kinds of questions out there. So. Um, does anybody want to turn off their mute and uh, get things going, or you can move on with your evening? I will add, uh, I did put into the chat, not just the article that he wrote for the Washington Post, uh, but you can look up Dr. Christakis on Twitter. I put his Twitter uh, uh, address there. Um, he has regular posts that are uh, 
uh, have lots of good information uh, reactions. Uh, I think John Hopkins was talking about an article that he had responded to already. Um, so if you're seeing things happening in the news and don't know what to make of it, uh, you can continue to get his updates uh, by going to Twitter. Anybody else have things on their mind? Are we, are we in a good place? Are we just all talk, trying to talk and we're muted? We're all, we're all being polite and deferring to one another. Isn't that good right, of us? Right. <laughs> uh, well, while people unmute themselves to keep talking or drop out, um, I'm so grateful to the faith communities, all, all of our churches and synagogues. And uh, I know the Islamic Society tonight has a, a similar type of call with somebody else coming up. Um, uh, the faith communities uh, have been just amazingly on the front of things. Uh, you may know faith people can sometimes be slow to make progress. And uh, boy, uh, I'm very proud of how we mobilized. Uh, in some cases, our congregations have made significant changes to the way we worship in a short amount of time. And I'm, I'm impressed uh, with what people are doing. Um, it's inspirational. Um, I'm glad we're on the front lines of these responses. Um, so it's just been fantastic to see. Well, I'll just jump in. My name is Honor Woodrow, um, and I'm a member of the Religious Society of Friends, Quakers. Um, and I heard about this call from uh, our yearly meeting secretary, Noah Merrill. Um, and I'm just really grateful to have had the opportunity to listen in on, on this. Um, most of our congregations across New England have started meeting by Zoom, um, and that's been really exciting to hear. And um, I think there's maybe a handful that we're still trying to meet in person outside, um, but this call is really going to help me to be able to encourage them to um, not do that. So uh, just really grateful for the connection and for um, seeing all of you and, and this information. Thank you. Great. Uh, thanks, Honor. I, I did get to meet with Noah uh, via Zoom last week. Uh, I'm in touch with the denominational leaders in the council uh, to do a little check-in around everything that's happening right now. Uh, I'd be happy to keep doing that and holding a Zoom meeting like this just for us without, without the doctor, just to check in about new questions that are arising and new situations that we were not anticipating so we can keep meeting this way. Um, it's great that I, I, you know, we do have a, a, a concern that it, it's hard to get messages from experts into our culture these days, that they're not trusted sources, but uh, trusted sources of information and direction are, are clergy and congregations. We, we aren't the experts. I'm not a, an epidemiologist, but um, in congregations, we, we have an opportunity to put a word out there that uh, may well be trusted uh, more so than other sources, even if it's the same message. So I'm glad that we're able to uh, do some of the things that you're talking about, uh, just asking congregations to do the right thing, and maybe we'll be heard for who the messenger is. Thank you very much, Jason. I, I would Bill. love to see this happen um, as frequently as we need it to happen to support each other and to make sure that we have good information. I, this guy is just simply amazing. And <laughs> I was glad he was so human and so animated in his sharing. I really yeah. am. So thank you. Yeah. Jason, thank you for uh, uh, hosting this and, and uh, putting this together. This is Bob Stewart from St. Paul's. Yes. And, um, you know, it's, you know, we just don't have enough information to know what's the best thing to do. Um, we have to rely on God. <laughs> to uh, kind of give us the direction and uh, do what uh, we do best, and that is to pastor our, our flocks as best we can. So, you know, I have a call list and that I call uh, so many parishioners and do a wellness check with them. Um, I am posting my weekly sermon I do a, a short service uh, um, that 
they can get on the website. And I just reassure them that um, if Easter comes and we're not together, we will celebrate Easter later. Um, and we'll, we'll still celebrate that. So I think we have to remain hopeful and uh, try and be as positive and, and keep everybody encouraged. And uh, with that being said, I, uh, you know, I'm, I'm willing to, to offer a prayer at this time before I jump off um, or however you would want to proceed. So. I, I certainly would welcome a prayer. So if, you, if you'd like to pray with us uh, before you go, I, go ahead, Bob. I, I, right. I'd appreciate that. Okay. And gracious God, we thank you for all your many blessings and all your many joys. We know that when Peter called out to you in the midst of a storm and you said to come and Peter was able to walk on that water, it was when he took his eyes off of you that he began to sink. Let us be mindful, O oh God, to keep us encouraged and to remember that if we keep our eyes on Jesus, that we will walk through this storm because you're in the midst of it. We ask that you bless each of us as we minister and pastor to our congregations, we ask that you be with all the doctors and nurses and healthcare workers, all those who are working on the front lines in the grocery stores, in the retail stores, the truckers, the numerous people that are at risk for us. We ask that you, being the great physician that you are, that you put your hands upon their bodies and you keep them safe and that you wrap your loving arms around all of us so that we can feel your presence. We ask all these things in Jesus' precious name. Amen. 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 I was muted for my amen, and I don't want that to happen. Uh, <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Pastor Bob. Um, I will be, uh, uh, before you go, I will be in touch with everyone who registered online. Uh, I will give a follow-up email. Uh, with some of the information that we covered, I think I will get a link to a recording of this um, uh, and some of those other things. Um, and if you did not register beforehand, um, just check in with our website over the next few days. If you go to nhchurches.org, um, I'll, I'll email you all directly, but I'll also be posting materials there. Uh, and we do post resources about, um, there's a training video for um, running worship services remotely. Um, uh, OneLicense.net is allowing, um, has a, an ex a special license for the next month uh, to be able to stream uh, music that's covered by their license. So there's all sorts of updates that will come up that are relevant to us if you keep checking in on our website or Facebook. So we'll keep that all going. Can I ask one more question? Sure, Nancy. Hi. Hi. I've, I've, this is only the second time I've used Zoom, so I was kind of losing the picture and everything. Um, um, I've been texting a person um, in um, North Carolina. She used to live up here in New Hampshire. And she sent me what her choir director said because they're not having uh, services any, uh, right now. And they, they can't um, practice the cantata. And the cantata um, is something, about, is he worthy? I don't know if anybody's heard of it. But she sent me the words um, to that. And I think I would like to send them to you, Jason. Um, and I will try very hard to do that <laughs> after this <laughs> is over. Um, my other question, my other comment was, I was, do you really think he said everybody should be tested? I mean, I've been self-isolating, go to the post office, have put a glove on, and if, if I need to, put a mask on, and then come home. But um, I've been inside and I have had no reactions or anything. But with all the people in, in South, uh, 
Korea getting tested, it seems like it kind of lets you know that, yeah, I'm okay. Right, right. So uh, uh, I'll let everyone chime in on that. But if, if you do have something, some words to a cantata, if anybody here has anything that they want to share with the whole group, uh, you can email me. It's simply jason at nhchurches.org. Um, okay. And I will uh, reflect that, uh, whatever you send out to the group. Okay. Um, but yeah, I, I think... Um, what, what I had heard was, uh, was two things from the doctor on that, was that uh, the more people who can be tested, ideally everyone could be tested. One, because it does help with containment, I think, Nancy, as you're suggesting, that I, I know if I'm safe or not. Um, but also that it does help with the development of vaccines, to be able to know what antibodies are forming um, and, and who's having a positive um, a, a, a healthy response versus a, a or not, uh, whether or not their bodies are fighting off the, the virus. So um, I think the more tests means more data. Uh, as a scientist, he wants more data. Um, so yeah, I, th I think the idea would be to have uh, everyone be tested to help generate new, new vaccines and better containment. Thank you. Well, I see the numbers are dropping. <laughs> they were down, we're down to Hollywood squares on my screen, at least. Um, the Brady Bunch. Uh, so I'll, I'm Marsha. Thank, yeah, thank, it's good to see you, Aaron. Good to see everybody here uh, from across the state. Um, thank you, Allison, uh, Reverend Allison, for being our host for the meeting today. Uh, thank you to Olympia for putting in a, an appearance there on Mommy's lap. Uh, I'm amazed that... Um, my daughter has not come through here with a cat to try to get the cat on camera, uh, but uh, maybe next time. So we'll, uh, we'll gather again and check in with each other later. I'll send around the info and the links. Thank Thanks. you. Thank you Thanks, all. Thanks, Jason. Yeah, be well, be well. Blessings to everyone. Also to you. Yes, you and your family. Also to you, thank you. Sure thing, Claudia, good to see you. Thank you. Good. Thank you, Jason. This was fabulous. Oh, Take good well, care. He's, he's, a, bye -bye. he's a great uh, doctor, so I was glad to have him here. All right. Thank you, Alex.